Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight at the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum of Oregon in Southwest Washington. Virtually, um, happy to bring this programming to you this evening. My name is Brandon Baker. I serve as executive director here at the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum. And we're very excited about this webinar tonight with George Topolidis and his project, Ottoman Greeks in the United States. Uh, the programs like these are part of our fall series on immigration, migration, and life in the adopted country, looking at the journey of immigrants to the United States. And as we saw with our last interview last month, uh, immigrants to Greece from the United States. So this will be an interesting conversation tonight for George to share his project, what he's been working on, and we're excited to bring that to you tonight. Um, this program is brought to you with support from the Regional Arts and Culture Council and the Oregon Cultural Trust. And of course, uh, from support by people like you who donate to HACCM to support the mission of the organization to uh, gather, preserve, and share the Hellenic and Hellenic American experience here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so I also wanna do some housekeeping notes tonight. Um, we have, as I said, if you would like to give to HACCM to support programs like this, we do ask that you go to hellenicamericancc.org forward slash donate. Again, that's hellenicamericancc.org forward slash donate to make that gift. I'll put a link there in the chat. Um, we also have uh, the Q&A feature tonight. So if you roll your cursor or your finger over your screen, you'll have see the menu pop up and there is a sort of two speech bubbles with the letters Q and A underneath. That's where you're gonna submit your questions for George tonight that he'll be answering at the end of the presentation he'll present. And then we'll we'll get to those Q&A questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, given the time allotted. So feel free, um, don't wait till the end. If you have a question, if it comes to mind, just hop right on there and submit that question and it'll be there at the end. In fact, it'll be one of the first ones we see. So don't wait till the end to get those in. We wanna make sure we have uh, lots of good questions for George tonight. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our guests this evening. George Topolidis is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology and Criminology and Law at the University of Florida. He holds degrees from Southern Connecticut State University in History and the University of Connecticut in Microbiology. His research interests are framed within the field of historical sociology and include allyship, racial identity, construction and contestation, uh, racial identity con construction and contestation, social memory, and U.S. immigration law. George is also founder and project coordinator for the Ottoman Greeks in the U.S. or OG OGUS at the University of Florida's Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. So George, welcome. We're so excited to have you tonight and I'll let you just go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Brandon. I'd also like to thank Santhi and all the good folks at the Hellenic American Cultural Center and Museum uh, who helped uh, set this night up, organize everything, um, and give me the opportunity here to present to you all um, this exciting project. Uh, I'd, I'd like to spend a few minutes just kind of introducing myself uh, beyond uh, the uh, professional experience I have and uh, talk a little bit about my background myself briefly. Uh, so uh, I'm a first generation immigrant to, to the United States, excuse me, uh, born in Athens, Greece. And uh, I moved here with uh, my parents uh, when I was very young. Uh, lived in the Northeast uh, for about 23 years and then uh, decided to pursue my uh, degree uh, in sociology uh, in the, at the University of Florida. Uh, first connected with the good folks at the Center for uh, Greek Studies at the University of Florida. Uh, and then also with the Center for European Studies and the Samuel Proctor History Program, uh, which is where the uh, uh, project was uh, established. Now, uh, you know, I, I very much identify with uh, with this project. So, um, being uh, of that heritage from uh, the former Ottoman Empire, my grandparents uh, specifically uh, left as refugees uh, as part of the exchange of populations. Uh, they were actually some of the last to leave uh, in uh, 1922, uh, and they were transferred to northern Greece. Uh, which is where uh, my father was born, my mother was born in southern Greece, uh, and ultimately we moved to the United States as immigrants. So I you know, kind of uh, uh, identify with all of that immigrant experience, with the refugee experience as well, and uh, you know that's what motivated me to uh, start this project uh, and to pursue uh, this um, uh, line of study. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, in order to begin here 
is kind of introduce you all to the project itself, uh, beginning with uh, the uh, web project website, which was set up with uh, the help of the good folks at um, the uh, CLAS, uh, the IT department at the University of Florida. Uh, everything you're going to see tonight uh, did not exist five years ago. It was all just you know a, a thought in my mind uh, about how to pursue and what to pursue, and I had no idea uh, exactly on how to do it. And if it wasn't for the help of all these great individuals at the Center for Greek Studies, uh, at the uh, Samuel Proctor History Program, uh, the IT department at UF, uh, the uh, libraries at UF, uh, none of this would exist. So uh, it is with their help that you are going to see uh, the, the fruits of all of this collective labor uh, from all these different departments and all these different individuals. So um, what you're looking at now is the website itself. And uh, this is kind of like the landing page for it. Uh, what, it. What is contained here is all types of general information. And what I'd like to do is kind of jump into uh, the collections, okay? Uh, so uh, first and foremost in the collections, uh, what uh, they contain are uh, three different categories. The first is uh, three-dimensional objects. Second is two-dimensional uh, objects. And then finally the interviews themselves. Uh, so just kind of give you an idea of where the uh, um, that those collections stand at this point. Uh, there's approximately uh, 30 to 40 three-dimensional objects that we've collected uh, during uh, interviews that we've conducted. Uh, there are over 50,000 um, individual images of uh, two-dimensional artifacts. So these include documents, uh, they include um pick photos uh, of individuals of places uh, of uh, objects that were brought from the uh, former ottoman empire to the united states directly uh so things like uh housewares jewelry embroidery um all kinds of uh keepsakes uh and uh, memorabilia mementos uh that families uh who were leaving the ottoman empire for the united states uh brought with them um and of course the interviews okay now the interviews uh, at this point uh that collection stands at over 200 um and it's a collection that continues to grow and i'll actually talk about that a little bit as well you know uh, as far as participation is concerned and uh people who would be interested in being uh in being interviewed volunteering for uh, uh for an interview uh how to go about doing that um so uh, just to give you some uh, examples of each of these uh, categories, what I'd like to do first is uh, provide an example of a three-dimensional object. So this is a flask, okay, that, was, uh, that is uh, composed of bronze. Uh, it stands about uh, 10 inches or so tall, the exact uh, measurements we have on doc documented and on record. Uh, and as you can see here, the interesting uh, ability to, to uh, view and examine this object in, in 3D format is actually an invaluable resource uh, for those interested in the arts and for those researching the arts um, specifically. Uh, so there's there, there are many more objects similar to this one that we've uh, collected that, again, are, are three-dimensional freestanding, uh, and we decided that uh, 3D, to capture them in 3D would be the, uh, the best uh, method. Uh, for documenting them. And now in addition to the 3D objects, we have two-dimensional objects. So this is an example of such an object. So again, this is freestanding, okay? Um, but uh, the, the uh, way that we were, we were uh, able to capture it was through individual photographs, through individual images at the time. Um, so this is an object as well, but uh, it's, it's in 2D instead of 3D. Um, and there's actually a, a really interesting story behind this object, which is why I wanted to uh, present it to you all. So um, I interviewed an individual who was in uh, uh, Florida, uh, and um, his family uh, was origin originated in Asia Minor, specifically in Northeastern uh, Asia Minor, in, in the area of the Black Sea, and specifically in the city of Samsun. And uh, after the interview was complete, you know, I thanked him for his time and uh you know i packed all my things away and left his home um and uh, about an hour later i get a call from him 
And he says, uh, George, you forgot your charger <laughs> at my home. So I was like, oh my God, thank you. Thank you for calling me. You know, I'm going to come back. I'll get it. And he goes, oh, and by the way, I just wanted to let you know uh, that, you know, in talking about, you know, all of these different uh, issues of uh, leaving the Ottoman Empire, how they left and all that, I forgot to mention that my uncle uh, had provided this keepsake for me. Uh, and he said, uh, I've been using it as an umbrella holder, he goes. But, uh, you know, maybe you want to look at it. He goes, I don't really understand what it says on it. Uh, but it's made of bronze and it has some writing on it and I can't really figure out what it says. So I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'd, I'd love to come back. Thank you for telling me that. Thank you for informing me rather about the charger, but I'd, I'd love to come back and take a look at it. And this is what he showed me. Okay. So what you're looking at here is a bombshell. Okay. Uh, it's a, uh, it's from World War I. And uh, what, what has happened to it here is it's been molded and reshifted and changed uh, into uh, a vase. Uh, and what you're seeing at the tail end here is uh, the ending of the word Sagarios, which is uh, a river in uh, Asia Minor, uh, where one of the major battles between the, the Greek and Turkish armies took place during the Greco-Turkish War. Uh, it turns out that uh, the respondents, the interviewee's uh, uncle, granduncle actually, had fought in that war. Uh, and he was part of the Ottoman army. Uh, so he was actually you know, on the side uh, of the Ottomans against, against the Greek army. Uh, and he took this bombshell. He was actually a very gifted artist, according to uh, the testimony that uh, the interviewee provided. He was a very good artist. Um, and he took this bombshell and, and molded it into this, into this vase. Um, and um, uh, if, if you look at it closely, it's just remarkable, the detail, uh, how he actually took it, you know, by hand and piece by piece and, you know, uh, molded it in such a way so, so as to create uh, this work of art. Um, so this is an example. This is just one example of the types of two-dimensional images that, uh, that we have. There's also documents, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. Um, and uh, those documents and all of these images are ultimately uh, going to be uploaded here. At the uh, University of Florida's digital collection, part of the uh, digital libraries collections. Um, and so far we've, we've actually begun that process. We started to upload some of these images. So what I'd like to do now is show you another uh, example of a document. Uh, this time, it is a, a codex, a, uh, a book of uh, meeting, uh, meeting minutes uh, from an organization that was set up in uh, Los Angeles by uh, first generation immigrants uh, from the island of Marmara. Uh, and uh, this society was uh, set up uh, in uh, 1907. Uh, by those immigrants and um, with the help of a uh, of Dr. Jim Dimitri there at the at the, during his interview uh, he graciously donated uh, these materials. So I digit this were all digitized by me while I was there performing the interview, um, and we were able to, with the help of course of uh, the uh, library's digital collections folks to to upload everything. So. Uh, these books are available in digital format for researchers to, to kind of flip through and uh, look at the minutes uh, from, the, meet, from the, the meetings of this organization. Um, also, uh, 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 financial records uh, are part of uh, the books, these books, it's actually three uh, volumes uh, together. Um, and, you know, ultimately these can be used for all types of research purposes, and this is part of what uh, the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. project uh, is is doing. It's trying to establish a uh, um, you know, an archive that is available to academics worldwide, uh, so that they can they can access and uh, use for their own purposes for their own research. Now, in addition to the two dimensional objects, the three dimensional objects, we also have interviews, and I've already talked about them. I'm I'm going to actually. Uh, um, I'm not going to have the opportunity now to provide you with an example uh, of the interviews, but they are in, uh, the majority of them are in English. Uh, I want to say about 90% of them are in English, uh, about 10% are in modern Greek. Um, and uh, like I said, that collection is continuing to grow and we're continuing to collect uh, interviews uh, from individuals throughout the United States who are descendants of immigrants from uh, the former Ottoman Empire.
Now, in addition to, to that collection to the archive, uh, we also are collecting data from the Ellis Island archive, and we're using that uh, data to map and trace uh, immigration from the former Ottoman Empire to the United States, specifically from those regions of, of the former Ottoman Empire uh, that are uh, today part of Turkey. Uh, so uh, at, the, at this point, we have over three, three and a half thousand uh, individual uh, entries, and uh, we are collecting all types of information about them, their name, you know, where, where they were born, their, their port of departure, um, everything that is available really from, from the Ellis Island archive is being put in one place and collected so that it can be used for research purposes. And what we're using it for uh, specifically at this point is to create a map uh, that traces, like I mentioned, immigration uh, from those regions of the former Ottoman Empire to the United States. So what you're seeing here uh, is what's called a heat density map, okay? Uh, the regions that you're seeing that are uh, bright and lit up, those are where uh, the majority uh, population of immigrants were born. Um, and the darker spots uh, represent lower density, so lower numbers of, in, of uh, immigrants born in those regions. Um, and as you can see, it's, it is a good uh, 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 sample here from pretty much a, a variety of cities uh, in what is today Turkey. Um, and in addition to being able to trace where they were, where the immigrants were born, we're also able to, to trace where they uh, settled. Um, and uh, at the moment, you know, the majority of uh, historical research sites, you know, the Northeast, the Midwest, the Northwest is, you know, primarily uh, the regions where uh, immigrants settled in the United States. Um, there are uh, um, work, there is work out there, scholarship out there that cites specific examples from other regions in the, in the United States that are um, lower in, in terms of the population density of, of immigrants uh, that arrived from, from Greece specifically. Um, and this research allows us to, to actually trace, you know, places that are not really, would not traditionally be thought of as final destination points for uh, immigrants from either Greece or the former Ottoman Empire. And yet, uh, you know, this, this resource, this data from the Ellis Island Archive makes that possible. Uh, so what you're seeing here, again, it's, a, it's another heat density map in this case. Uh, and you're seeing, of course, New York and, you know, the, the Midwest, just like the, the historical research, research uh, uh, of course, has, uh, has shown, and also the Northwest uh, U.S., but also places like you wouldn't think, like Oklahoma uh, and, you know, in, in the mid-U.S. here in St. Louis. Um, and this is just a sample of 100 entries, okay? This month, I'm actually working on uh, expanding this, uh, this sample to uh, over 1,000. Uh, so this map is going to look a little bit different uh, about at the end of uh, this month. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process, ongoing research, and um, ultimately, you know, we're going to continue to collect this data and update this map um, uh, to raise awareness, right, first and foremost. So, uh, you know, in, in the academic community to, to raise awareness about, you know, where this immigration took place, where these people came from, where they ultimately settled, but also for general public, you know, it's, this is important information for them as well. Of course, it's more important than anything else to, to be able to trace, you know, immigration from, from uh, the former Ottoman Empire to, to the U.S. It's, it's a part of uh, some research that, you know, is ongoing and, and of course, needs to be uh, expanded. Um, now, in addition to the map um, and, and uh, the work we're doing with trying to trace migration, um, interviews are ongoing, okay? So um, if you or anyone you know is interested in being interviewed, uh, you know, this is the place to do it. Uh, there is uh, a, and I'm gonna share this link with you here. Um, if you're interested and know anyone who would be uh, interested in, in being interviewed, just uh, have them migrate to this page, uh, you know, uh, and fill in this information and we will contact them and get an interview scheduled with them uh, so that we can document this important information, okay? The, the interviews are document, documenting information not only about experiences of immigrants in the former Ottoman Empire, that's a big component of what, what the uh, interview guide does, uh, but just as important, just as large of a component is their life in the United States. Um, in addition, uh, we're documenting uh, any type of information they have about you know, the journey over, if they stopped anywhere along the way uh, prior to coming to the U.S. And ultimately when they uh, settled, 
you know, where, how was their life? What were their experiences like? And we use uh, pretty uh, unique uh, methods to try to gauge, you know, what kinds of information they know or they remember, um, you know, besides just the, the standard informal questioning, uh, you know, there's other components of the interview guide that are uh, important and play an important role in trying to help people, you know, remember, trying to help people reconnect uh, with that part of their lives and ultimately uh, help us uh, preserve it. Uh, so uh, that would be uh, very helpful if you're interested or, you know, like I said, if you know anybody else who would be interested to contact us uh, through our webpage uh, and help us schedule an interview. Now, in addition to interviewing, We've done some work already uh, with the material that we found, uh, specifically in podcasting. Uh, that's one medium that we've used so far. Uh, there are some um, publications that I'm working on, uh, but there, there's also some work that's being done outside of my own work uh, by undergrads currently uh, who are working on specific interviews and are getting uh, things arranged to uh, sort of publish online at first and maybe make more of it uh, in the near future. But what I'd like to do now at this point is kind of share with you an example of what, uh, you know, experiences immigrants had from the former Ottoman Empire coming to the United States um, uh, through a podcast that, uh, again, with the help of the great folks at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program I was able to produce, uh, would not have happened without them. Um, it is uh, uh, titled The Acropolis and the Madonna, and it is, a, uh, as you'll see, a story about uh refugees escaping the former Ottoman Empire, coming to the United States, uh, and uh, basically their experiences uh, and in uh, their interface with the U.S. bureaucracy upon their arrival. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and play that for you. Did you know that in April of 2016, the European Union deported 12 Syrian refugees back to Turkey? Though these were... My apologies. Okay, so this seems to be freezing. Just give me one second. Did you know that in April of 2016, the European Union deported 12 Syrian refugees back to Turkey? Though these refugees were in need of asylum, they were denied because of the xenophobic forces influencing EU policy. Public figures in the EU and the US are once again discriminating against refugees, and in the process transporting us through a time warp to the early 20th century. At that time, the dehumanization of refugees facilitated the ratification of immigration restrictions against them. My name is George Topolitis, and this is the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. podcast series in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. All interview clips used in this podcast series are with descendants of immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire. A hundred years ago, discriminatory public rhetoric resulted in the drafting of the most restrictive immigration legislation in U.S. history, the Immigration Restriction Act of 1921. The act's main provision established annual quotas based on a 3% immigrant admission rate per nationality. Lawmakers derived this figure using the number of U.S. residents' country of origin as reported in the 1910 U.S. Census. When the quota was exhausted for a given year, any additional immigrants were deported to their country of origin. This legislation had detrimental effects on some of the most vulnerable targets of the time, 90 Armenian and Greek refugees from Smyrna. Smyrna was a wealthy port city on the western coast of Asia Minor. It hosted many western merchant companies and supported large trade networks within Asia Minor and beyond. In the spring of 1922, Smyrna's influential Greek inhabitants had every reason to be optimistic about their position in the city's future. The Greek army landed in the city on May 15th of 1919 
and had since then successfully campaigned eastward to the outskirts of Ankara. The Turkish army, led by Mustafa Kemal, failed to curtail the Greek advance in the summer of 1920. The Ottoman Empire was on its last breath. Meanwhile, and according to the following testimony from a descendant of Zmirna refugees, life in Zmirna coasted along. When he was a kid, the Sultan was still there. And they would have in the cafe, you know, all the male people of the community spent their life in the cafe. And he said they had the heroes of 1821 up on the wall, you know, pictures. But whenever the soldiers are from the Sultan, they knew they were coming, they would pull those down and hide them and put the Sultan's picture up. Because they would come in and, you know, check and see what was going on. Yeah, I remember him telling me that story. And then once the soldiers were gone, they put the heroes back up again. When news spread of the Greek front's collapse in late August 1922, panic gripped the city's Greek and Armenian communities. On September 1st, the exhausted Greek soldiers entered the city by foot and in the process justified the panic of Izmir's inhabitants. By 10 p.m. on September 8th, the Greek governance of the city ended and the last Greek troops departed for Athens by September 19th. On September 9th, Mustafa Kemal, fresh from his victory over the Greek army two weeks prior, arrived in Zmirna. He issued a warning that the Armenians and Greeks of the city should not be harmed. However, that warning was not effectively enforced. Four days later, the Armenian quarter of the city was the starting point of a fire that consumed it and all of the Greek quarter by September 16th. These events were catastrophic for the city's residents, as attested by a descendant whose family experienced them firsthand. My great uncle, his wife, and his children, I think there were two of them at least, may have been more, I don't know, at least two, they were murdered. That was the word that was used by my great aunt. Um, I think they were marked off somewhere. And she, she used the word machine gun to death. And she was supposed to be married actually the weekend after that happened. They had set for the wedding. But when that happened, they killed the groom. They burned the house that he had built course the place burned down and along with it all of her all of her stuff that she had ready for the marriage and she barely escaped rape actually because only because she ran into the area of town where there were European people and a French family took her in off the streets they were, the soldiers were after her and they took her in and I guess they wouldn't mess with you know, foreign people, European, French families, and like that. They only mess with the Armenians and the Greeks. And so she told us about all of that. And then after it was over, she went and found her mother, who had somehow escaped all of this slaughter, and probably due to the foster son that they had taken in, it's in these pictures. And all of them together, I guess, went down to the waterfront and were able to get on a boat and go to Piraeus. Both Greeks in Greece and the Ottoman Empire alike recognized Smyrna as the emblematic cosmopolitan city of Asia Minor. As is the case with the modern Syrian refugees, the nearby Aegean islands of Lesbos and Chios were initial stops for the Smyrna refugees before journeying to mainland Greece and other Western destinations, including the U.S. The journey for the Armenian and Greek refugees from Smyrna was arduous and long. This was due to the coal power ship engine technology of the time, as well as the quarantine hold times at refugee camps in Constantinople, Thessaloniki, Piraeus, and Patras. The refugees left Piraeus aboard the SS Acropolis on November 2nd, 1922, for the island of Syros. After making port, the ship proceeded to Patras and arrived there on November 10th. At Patras, 200 refugees from Constantinople were urged aboard. Horace Stiles, the U.S. consul in Patras, warned the Greek authorities that the immigration quota pertaining to Armenians and Greeks for that year had already expired. The ship spent 34 days docked in Patras due to a crew strike and lack 
lack of provisions for the journey. Finally, on December 13th, the ship set out for Valletta, Malta, with the refugees from Smyrna on board. Fuel was entirely consumed during the journey to Malta, and the crew started to burn wood from the ship itself for additional fuel. The Acropolis reached Malta on December 18th and stocked up on coal and provisions. While there, the ship's captain deserted and the ship's crew continued the journey to New York. The Acropolis made two more mandatory stops for fuel in Algiers and the Azores. During this journey, two babies were born on board. According to a New York Times article, the Acropolis reached New York Harbor four days later, but, quote, immigration officials refused to permit any of the immigrants to land until the federal authorities in Washington had ruled on the cases of Greeks, Armenians, and others whose quotas had been exhausted, unquote. Ellis Island doctors and clerks were the first officials that the refugees encountered upon their arrival to Ellis Island. These agents documented immigrant arrivals, screened them for diseases, and determined if they would be admitted, quarantined, or deported using a rudimentary process. They were checked as they were leaving the boat, and there was somebody with a piece of chalk that wrote something on their clothing that indicated, you know, a limp, cockeyed, or whatever that symptoms the person looked like they had. So they were taken aside and given more attention to whether they were going to let them in. There was somebody who got sent back three times for whatever reason, and the fourth time was the shot. <laughs> Seven refugees were hospitalized, and one of the seven, Ankino Ashakian, passed away in Ellis Island's infirmary. The refugees were facing deportation to Piraeus due to the Greek officials embarking them despite the consul's warning. It was at this juncture that a New York City-based attorney, Malcolm Vartan Malcolm, became involved. I'm a Harvard grad, class of 1913. In 1916, I moved to New York City and resided at 2 Rector Street. In 1919, I authored a book entitled The Armenians in America. And five years later, I testified in a case challenging the legal obstacles that Armenians encountered in attaining U.S. citizenship. Originally an immigrant from Sivas, Turkey, myself, I became the Smyrna refugee's primary advocate to the press. You could say that I'm somewhat of an advocate for Armenian immigrant rights. Malcolm evoked the literacy exception of the Immigration Act of 1917 for religious refugees in order to acquire a writ of habeas corpus. Federal Judge Learn Hand was responsible for issuing the writ. Hand was born in Albany, New York, and graduated from Harvard in 1896. He moved to New York City in December of 1902 and married Franz Frank. His wife was a well-known Philhellene and may have impacted Judge Leonard's disposition toward the Smyrna refugees. When they arrived at Ellis Island, Hand was the presiding federal judge in New York City. He granted a writ of habeas corpus to Malcolm, and thereby a stay of the refugees' deportation order and a hearing of their case. His action was standard legal procedure, but it also challenged the authority of Ellis Island agents. The writ only applied to 51 Armenian refugees on the Acropolis. However, the reportage contested the timeliness of the writ's delivery to Ellis Island Commissioner Robert E. Todd. According to Todd, the ship was already underway when he received the writ. Malcolm insisted that the writ was served to the commissioner at 5.30 p.m. prior to the ship's departure, and not at 6 p.m. when the ship was already en route. Additionally, an official on the ship offered to stop it and allow the Armenians to disembark, but Todd refused. In Malcolm's own words, after obtaining the writ of habeas corpus from Judge Han, which would have enabled the Armenians to obtain consideration as persons persecuted for their religion, which they are, I telephoned to Ellis Island to announce the fact and to arrange to put the men, women, and children off the ship. I couldn't get the commissioner at first, but talked to a Mr. Landis, who refused to listen to the suggestion that he should confirm the issuance of the writ and take the people off the ship. Malcolm relayed Todd's statements to the press and exposed him as a nativist ideologue. It was too late to get over to Ellis Island with the writ, so I went to the battery with Mr. Jones, an official of the Faber line, who had two tugs ready to go down the bay and take off the persons named in the writ. Mr. Todd came on a late boat. I served the writ on him, 
He was extremely angry. He said no such trade had ever been served on him before. He said the Armenians were a dirty lot and that he would do nothing for them. Mr. Todd repeated that they were in excess of their quota and that he would not give the authority to do this, writ or no writ. In the same newspaper article, Todd defended his decision and rejected Malcolm's accusation. Oh, we can't pay any attention to telephone communications. We don't know anything about where they're coming from. The fact of the matter is that the writ was not served until it was too late to act on it. The United States District Attorney has ruled that we are not to interfere with ships that have started on their way. If we interfered in this case, the ship would have been held up for hours. How could we know whether we were getting the right ones? In regards to the charge that he referred to the Armenians as, quote, a dirty law, unquote, he replied, I used no such language and said nothing that reflected on them in any way. Despite his defense, the publication of such a charge may have tarnished Todd's reputation. Although the exact cause is unknown, Henry Kern relieved Todd of his post later that year. The Acropolis's journey ended with its transfer of the Smyrna refugees to New York. This was the ship's final voyage by that name. The Boris Shipping Company purchased it at some point prior to April 28, 1923, and renamed it as the SS Washington. The SS Madonna, belonging to the Faber shipping line, transported the Smyrna refugees back to Piraeus, Greece on February 9, 1923. The Zmirna refugees and modern Syrian refugees' experiences have a lot in common. Both were expelled from their native lands, which were obliterated. They both followed the same escape routes to the U.S. And the same xenophobia endured by the Zmirna refugees is now an obstacle for the Syrian refugees' path to asylum. In the winter of 1923, that xenophobia resulted in the deportation of the Zmirna refugees back to Greece. The legal options and technological tools available to U.S. officials today can and should facilitate a better outcome than deportation of Syrian refugees. Okay, so um, this is just a, an example, like I said, of the type of work uh, that can be produced from the archives, the archival materials uh, collected as part of the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. project at the University of Florida. Um, you know, this particular podcast had a very specific subject and topic, of course, the um, topic of deportation, uh, the topic of immigration from the former Ottoman Empire and uh, connections to the present uh, and the, the Syrian wave of refugees uh, to the United States, to Greece and to the United States, really, because like, like the podcast mentioned it, you know, the, the pathways and the experiences are very similar um, for both uh, for both groups and both cohorts. And um, you know, it, it, the similarities go beyond, of course, just uh, Syrian refugees and, and uh, refugees from uh, the former Ottoman Empire. You know, we can think about people seeking asylum from uh, Central and South America as well as having uh, very similar experiences uh, and, um, you know, ultimately uh, being treated in, in very harsh ways uh, as well. Um, so uh, that, like I said, that's just one, an, an, one example uh, of the type of work uh, that can be done using uh, the materials from the Ottoman Greeks of the, of the U.S. Uh, archives. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about briefly is just, you know, ways to connect with the project and uh, keep up with new materials being produced. So I'd like to introduce you, if you don't already know, uh, to our Facebook page. This is a major platform that we use uh, for the project uh, to share information, to share new uh, projects, that are sub-projects really. Uh, you know, publications, all types of things that are being done by students at UF uh, using the archives um, and uh, work that's being done by uh, researchers that are either at UF or uh, outside of UF that have used the archives as well. Uh, so um, I, what I'll do for you is uh, paste that um, uh, URL here uh, so you have for your information. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to mention, I've been mentioning it all night, uh, you know, this, again, this would not have happened with, without the help of uh, great individuals at the Sam and Proctoral History Program, the Center for Greek Studies, the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida, all helped and all helped guide uh, the establishment of this project and its continued maintenance and, and expansion. 
Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, sort of introduce you all to uh, a way to help. Uh, and if you're interested in any, in, uh, any ways of uh, helping fund any future uh, uh, work that we do, uh, you know, the, the uh, funds will ultimately be used uh, for, by students and for students uh, so to help support their research, uh, to help support uh, hopefully future interviews in person, um, and uh, in addition to help uh, you know, support their activities in any way, uh, as long as they're using the, the archives, the Samuel Proctoral History Program, the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. project, of course, is being one of those archives, uh, that those funds would be um, you know, uh, in the short term helping them uh, you know, spare, uh, raise awareness about this, this immigrant group, about their experiences, um, and ultimately help, you know, uh, providing uh, the public more awareness uh, about what happened, uh, the events that occurred uh, in the former Ottoman Empire and how they impacted uh, a mass refugee wave, a mass immigrant wave and refugee wave uh, to the United States. Um, additionally, in the, you know, long term, uh, what we're hoping to do with the Ottoman Greeks of the U.S. project is uh, establish the first uh, chair in Ottoman Greek studies uh, at the University of Florida. So that's long term plans. Uh, in the short term, we're, we're trying to raise awareness, uh, collect more data, um, and uh, help raise awareness in, in, in general uh, about this immigrant group. Uh, so with that, I'd like to um, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time, the time that you've spent, uh, and dedicated to uh, uh, listening uh, to, to, this, to the information about this project. Uh, I'd like to thank you all, and I will take any questions you may have uh, at this point. Well, George, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. It was great to get an overview of the project you've been working on that you've been given some blood, sweat and tears to. It's, it's obvious that uh, this, is, this is a passion project and it's been uh, eye-opening and enlightening for me uh, to hear more about it. Uh, we do have some questions in the Q&A um, that we can go through here. Um, I know that, so it says John and Joanne uh, Nikon, or Nikon, um, did ask a question, they were unable to stay till the end. And so unfortunately they won't hear your answer, but I think it might help some other folks. Um, so they were asking about accessing this website you were showing off uh, directly. And so I think you've put that link in there. And of course we can, sir, we can provide that link. Let me put this answer live here. Um, we can provide that link in a follow-up email to the guest, but uh, so can you talk a little bit about creating this online museum and, and sort of, You've obviously you've shown these different aspects of it and how this came to be that you thought, I want to put this all online as a resource versus say having a physical center at the University of Florida. Yeah, um, this was partially my idea, mostly the idea of uh, the individuals that help bring it, you know, into existence. Um, you know, as far as space is concerned, you know, as a, as a, start, as a grad student starting out, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult to make such proposals and, you know, try to gain space. I mean, it, I, at the time that the website started to take shape, take form, um, you know, there weren't interviews. <laughs> there, there wasn't material. Um, you know, it was just an idea. And, and the work that I had done previous to uh, beginning my PhD at the University of Florida um, kind of lent itself to thinking about uh, a website and an online uh, platform. So I had, I, had, I had finished my master's of art at the at Southern Connecticut State University in, in uh, history at the time. And I had collected some materials already from the Ellis Island archive uh, that I mentioned, and also some newspaper archives, uh, the New York Public Library's uh, newspaper archives specifically. Um, and I was thinking, you know, how can I make this uh, uh, material available to researchers. Now, the the, the newspaper materials are, you know, there's a, there's some obstacles, uh, you know, that that are inherent to trying to uh, uh, publicize uh, those types of materials, and ha it has to do a lot with copyright and, you know, the way that that libraries store things, and you know, ultimately those obstacles made it uh, very difficult to try to try to publicize uh, materials that are specific to. Uh, this particular immigrant group, uh, refugee group as well. Um, but the Ellis Island Archive is, is public information available online. So, you know, that, that type of material, you know, can be shared. It can be used by researchers as well. And, you know, the, the, the great folks at the Ellis Island uh, Foundation are very 
uh, open and gracious to, to sharing that information with the, with the general public. So uh, that, that made the map available just off the bat, you know, because I had the data, uh, you know, I was able to, to share it and to, to credit, of course, the Ellis Island uh, Foundation. Um, so that's how it began, really. You know, it, it was just, just a matter of, you know, was it really, was it realistic for me at that stage, <laughs> you know, to find a space and to conceptualize, you know, what that space would look like? It just wasn't. Uh, but an online platform made it more uh, possible, more of a possibility, I guess would be the answer. Great. Yeah, I think it's it's a tremendous resource that, you know, just watching you go through it here with us tonight, clear that, you know, anybody can access this. It provides an opportunity for folks to to learn about maybe their own history or at least to hear that there are other people who have a similar experience and perhaps get connected to your uh, to your project. So that's it's been really cool to see. Um, uh, Dina writes, um, is wondering if the interview guide is available for others to use. I live in Canada and my immediate family did not come directly from the Ottoman Empire. Rather, it was likely at least three generations ago. Father was born in Greece. I spent about one and a half years of Sunday afternoons interviewing my father, all recorded. And so looking for a place, I think, to, to have that. So I think two questions is, do you have any advice for Dina with to, to where to take those recordings? And two, um, I think... This also begs the question, do you have any plans to expand this project outside of the United States? Surely um, Ottoman Greeks, Greeks from Asia Minor migrated elsewhere other than the United States. So if you could maybe dive into that as well. Yeah, of course. Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, we, you know, first to get to, to Dina's answer to Dina's question kind of, um, you know, the interview guide will be made available after my, uh, the publication of my dissertation. Um, that will be, then it will be public information. Anybody will be able to use it. Um, we're hoping uh, to uh, share it with people who would be interested, like Dino, to, to um, interview folks at that point, um, and ultimately to help uh, expand the archive at the University of Florida. So to kind of circle towards your answer, uh, Brand, to Drew's question, Brandon, uh, yes, we are uh, thinking about expanding specifically to Canada um, and to other points in Central South America, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we've we, I've identified myself, you know, particular communities um, that uh, were, were points of settlement for Ottoman Greeks, uh, you know, as well. And uh, that is something I'm working towards, you know, trying towards finding information about uh, those particular cities. You know, for example, Havana, um, you know, uh, um, Vallarta, Mexico. Uh, some of some South American cities as well, like Buenos Aires, uh, you know, have come up in the interviews that I've done already. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, these are these are of course topics of interest, and and uh, I will be looking in the future to expanding it uh, to other regions um, in in the Americas. So it's gonna it's gonna be focused on the Americas, uh, um, ideally. Yeah. Perfect. That's great. Uh, George asks, what was the role of the great powers in the time of the conflict? Sort of a history lesson there. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's like, there's a few, you know, just to kind of give an overview, a general overview. Um, you know, when we're talking about the Entente and the, the importance of the Entente, there's some books uh, that have, that are wonderful books that have been written about, you know, the politics at play and, um, you know, Michael Wendell and Smith comes to mind, Greeks in Asia Minor. Um, uh, as well as uh, sort of the bottom-up perspective, you know, how people experienced uh, uh, their lives in Greece after the exchange of populations. So uh, Rene Hirshon's uh, book, Heirs of the Greek Catastrophe, uh, also uh, comes to mind uh, and would be helpful as well. But, you know, there's, there's generally, there's many different narratives about how the Entente was involved or wasn't involved, uh, you know how they how they impacted the uh, the events specifically how Greece and and Turkey uh, or, or rather the provisional government of Turkey at the time you know were were um, uh, by some authors manipulated by other authors you know allied with <laughs> the Entente uh, and ultimately you know how that power play uh, uh, resulted in in the outcomes uh, that we all know. And I think uh, maybe this is a, another uh, history question for you is uh, Chrysanthi asks, why were the Greeks slash Armenians spared in Constantinople during this time? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, good friend Chrysanthi, 
my answer to that is, you know, because of the Treaty of Severus, really, and this provisional treaty that was signed, but not signed by all parties, just, you know, Greece and, and Britain kind of came to an agreement as to what would happen to, to the regions of Dardanelles. Um, and, you, you know, was, it, they came to an agreement, basically, that Britain would hold the Straits and would hold uh, Constantinople uh, and Greece, uh, the Greek army uh, and provisional governments of Greece, really, uh, suzerains uh, would hold, of Greece would hold lands uh, west of Constantinople and then uh, in the hinterland of Izmir um, and ultimately what ended up being you know east of Izmir, Izmir as well uh, but it was the British protecting um, um, Constantinople at the time uh, that kind of spared uh, Armenians and, and Greeks living there uh, from from conscription, from certain death, and other, from certain death has occurred in other regions of um, of the empire. Okay. Well, we've got lots of history questions, I think, pouring in for you here. Um, but uh, I, this interesting one here from uh, Yorgos. Uh, Thank you for your work. Have you done any analysis of interviews regarding the identifications of the refugees? I presume the refugees were heterogeneous cultural collective. Yes, uh, that is the topic of my dissertation. Uh, so the answer to, to the question is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the identity question is central to these interviews. Uh, one of the many central questions, but, but, one, but identity for sure is a central question in these interviews. Um, and, you know, just trying to, trying to assess really what stories, you know, what narratives have been passed on uh, from generations, transgenerational, a passage of, of I, stories about identity and uh, specifically about the construction of identity, the social construction of identity at, at the time of their arrival in the U.S., even previous to that, um, and the contestation of, of those uh, constructed social, socially constructed identities is, is a topic of the dissertation, yes. Well, then we'll have some good reading material when you, when you publish your dissertation to dive into that. Um, so uh, Cindy asks... Uh, George, have you documented any ship info on Pontians uh, that arrived here on Plymouth Rock ports? Uh, wow, yeah, that's a good question. So Ellis Island, the Ellis Island Foundation's archive is uh, focused on uh, arrivals in New York uh, in, in Ellis Island. Uh, but yeah, through the ship manifest, of course, you could, you could trace and see where uh, as the map showed, where the uh, places of settlement, or, uh, the initial places of settlement, I should say, were for uh, immigrants coming from different parts of the former Ottoman Empire. So yeah, you can definitely trace, you know, uh, individuals who uh, immigrated from uh, regions of northeastern Turkey uh, and uh, arrived to the New York and then ultimately settled in, in places like Boston and uh, Lowell, um, and other uh, Watertown, Massachusetts, some, some are just coming to mind now, uh, vaguely, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it can be done. And, and, and we, we have this data uh, and we're continuing to collect it. Great, and uh, so I think Cindy also wanted to know, is there a way to access that data at this point or not quite yet? Uh, not quite yet, unfortunately, yeah. So this is, okay, so um, this is raw data, right? It's coming right <laughs> off of the ship manifests. So uh, for it to be shareable, publishable, um, you know, for it to even be analyzable, to do any sort of analysis from it, uh, you know, it takes a certain amount of cleanup, uh, as we as we call it in in, in uh, uh, graduate student circles. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to spend some time, kind of, you know, looking at it and trying to decipher sometimes, you know, what handwritten uh, material is there and what does it mean and uh, you know, establish patterns uh, before you can share anything and make it you know, make it club public. Uh, and at that point, the data becomes public as well. The data is available through the Ellis Island Archive. It's just a matter of what I've been doing over the course of the past decade plus is meticulously collecting, you know, one entry at a time to get to the point now where we have over 3,000 names and that, that process is continuing. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not going to be available right away is my answer, uh, but we're working towards doing that, towards making it available. Yeah. So ultimately just keep an eye on that map because uh, it's going to continue to grow and, you know, those bright spots that you saw are going to get a lot brighter. Uh, and uh, some, of, some of those darker spots are going to get very bright as well. 
uh, as we continue to, to grow the sample. Um, and uh, that would be the primary place to find the data uh, ultimately too, as we continue to go through this process of, of you know, cleaning it and, and making it publishable, uh, it's gonna ultimately end up um, on the map. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about that, that, uh, that fantastic GIS map that you brought up and to think about that, it, you know, it's accurate only as with the information that you have, that it, that it shows a really great heat map of where people are coming from and where, and where they ended up in the United States. But it's only it's only as good as the data you have, and so I'm, so there's a question on here about um, you know where did the majority where do most Asian minor refugees uh, and I'm assuming we're talking about uh, Ottoman Greeks. This is from Irene. Where have they settled in the United States? And so I think your map sort of indicates something right now, but maybe that data is is only partially complete. So you know yeah. So uh, I, yeah, that's absolutely correct. everything you just said is absolutely correct. First and foremost, you know. Uh, the size of the sample is is very important, right? And we're, with this map, and I'll put the map back, back up here real quick. Uh, this map that you're looking at, as I mentioned, is is just 100 entries, okay? So you're looking at, at 100 individuals. Um, and you could already see patterns that, you know, align with existing scholarship. So th there is work out there that already talks about, uh, you know, where uh, major hubs of, uh, uh, you know, Ottoman Greek uh, uh, origin existed uh, in the former Ottoman Empire. So, you know, you're talking about individuals who were born there, first of all, right? Um, and by the, by the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire authorities, uh, you know, were uh, um, considered to be citizens uh, during this time. Uh, so, so those individuals, you know, you're seeing, for example, in Istanbul, or, you know, what is today Istanbul at Izmir, what is today Izmir at Trabzon? You know what is today Tra Trabzon? Uh, these are these are uh, well documented hubs. You know this is this this is where uh, a very large Greek Grecophone Greek Orthodox speaking populations existed, uh, and that is all well known. Um, but you're right. You know as the as the as the sample continues to grow, um, I I am going to uh, based on this scholarship, say with some confidence that those spots like Istanbul, like Izmir, like Trabzon are gonna become brighter. So more and more individuals are gonna just pile on to those cities because those cities are known to have had, you know, large populations. Uh, and, um, you know, some other areas are, are surprising for sure. You know, you wouldn't, exp you know, in, right in the middle of, you know, uh, Central Asia, what is known as Central Asia Minor, you know, Central Turkey, you know, you see, see places like uh, Mustafa Pasha, which is uh, also known as Sinasos. Um, you know, you see places like Kesaria, uh, Sivas, in Sevastopol. Um, you know, these are, these are individual cities at this point, and just based on a, on a sample of 100, you know, they're appearing. So I would imagine that as I continue to build on this sample and, you know, go for, go through the, the uh, data that I've already collected, but continue to, to uh, collect, you know, this is just, these are, these cities are just going to start to become more and more dense, uh, and, you know, population wise, and some more will appear, I'm sure that you just can't, you know, predict at this point. So, uh, but uh, yeah, was, I, I, was, I, I was wondering, I, I, I was wondering also like what, what, what surprised you. So I'm glad you, you delved into that a bit. If there was anything that surprised you, that's, that, that was great to hear that as well. Um, I feel free to answer this one as you, as you wish. Uh, so Gus asks a question about where your family comes from. Um, and, and, you know, do you want to speak about that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, I'm a, a second generation uh, descendant of uh, immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire, specifically from the cities of uh, Trapezunda, as it was known then. Uh, and... Um, Argyrupolis, as it was known, and more uh, smaller villages that I'm not going to mention that were near those cities, basically. Uh, but those are the two cities that my family was originally from. Uh, so, um, you know, I was told stories about these places as a kid, you know, like everybody, like everybody else who has an immigrant background, um, you know, that I, I hold dear to my heart. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the place of origin for uh, my, my family member, my family members, my ancestors. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to actually ask you if you can click on the Q&A and Sophie has a question and she asked some, some great questions about specific islands. And I'm going to go ahead and let you nail the pronunciations of those islands <laughs> rather than me stumbling through it. 
So sure, sure. Sophie's question. Absolutely. So uh, have you interviewed any descendants from the islands of Tenedos, Ofrimion, Neohori, and Crithia? And where did they predominantly settle in the USA? My own family settled in Wheeling, West Virginia. Is there any documentation of the brotherhoods uh, that were established there that you know of? So Sophie's a good friend of mine. Actually, we've talked many times about this uh, subject. Thank you, Sophie, for that question. Um, yeah, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> you know, we've, we've interviewed individuals from Tenedos, uh, Ofrinion as well, and Neohori, Kritia. I would have to look back at the interview list. I'm not really sure. That doesn't just pop to mind at this point. Um, but uh, yes, uh, the, the answer to that is we have uh, interviewed individuals from those, er from those areas. Um, and uh, as far as uh, the data from the brotherhoods that exist there, we do have some data from there. Uh, that we've picked up that ultimately will be uh, uploaded to, to the uh, University of Florida's digital collection. Well, we've got uh, quite a few more here. I, I do want to try to get as many as we can, but I also want to uh, acknowledge that we, we're probably running short on time here. So we've got maybe eight more minutes and I'll try to answer or ask as many questions as we can. Um, Litsa asks, I know there were misspellings when my ancestors went through Ellis Island would it help you and your project have access to their actual names and how they were versus how they were identified at the time of arrival? Sort of both of those things. Yeah, uh, so this is a great question. And this is actually something that very early on, uh, you know, I, I realized as well. As I, as I started to uh, do just preliminary searches uh, on the Ellis Island Foundation's archive, uh, I realized that there were a lot of misspellings and on two levels, misspellings on two levels, what I mean by that, you know, the, the wonderful folks at the Ellis Island Foundation, you know, meticulously did a, a, a Herculean task in digitizing uh, all of these uh, manifests. Um, and, you know, they used volunteer work, um, you know, and very often uh, mistakes were made in the uh, data uh, uh, translation, you know, the names specifically. Uh, so that's one level. The other level is actually on the manifest, okay? So very often you look at a manifest and, you know, the, the, the digital entry will say one thing, right? And then, and it's actually spelled correctly. And then you go into the, into the manifest and it's just a mess, you know, the way that it was handwritten, you know, you, you kind of have to sit there and decipher the, the, the handwriting, uh, ultimately. I have a great example uh, that I bring up uh, uh, for one of my presentations uh, that talks about limitations of the data. Uh, and one of the limitations, you know, are these misspellings. Uh, so for, for, uh, my, for that presentation, I bring up this, the uh, city of Saranda de Quixies, uh, or Kirk Lisse. Uh, Kirk Lisse. Kirk uh, is, is the modern uh, uh, name of the, of the town. And, um, you know, Saranda de is written at least 12 different ways uh, on the manifest. You know, anything and everything from the English version to the Turkish version to, you know, malformations of Greek, you know, jumbled in different ways. And, you know, it just takes time to sit there and, and kind of, you know, document all of this. So what I had to do very early on is find a good source, uh, you know, uh, to kind of help me trace uh, where these names were coming from. And I, I did uh, find one online uh, with... Uh, uh, a, cent a, a research center in Greece uh, that has uh, published it online uh, and it kind of lists all of the different na city names in, in Greek. Um, so it helps to be able to speak Greek, which I do. Uh, and I was able to, you know, read the Greek and, and kind of make out what the, uh, uh, you know, the documented form of the city name was on the, on the ship manifest. Um, and I use that in addition to things like Google, you know, and, and Google Maps. Uh, that has been a tremendous help as well, you know, trying to trace uh, the city names. And, and there's problems, of course, inherent problems with using Google and Google Maps because of the, of the you know, tremendous t times, the, the, the tremendous number of times that city names ch have changed, you know, over the course of, you know, those, those two decades and beyond, uh, but with, even within those two decades. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a puzzle that, you know, you, you kind of have to work through and, you know, at this point in my research, I have, you know, a code, a, a set of city codes that I've developed from doing this, you know, over and over and over again. And, you know, that helps minimize, uh, but not completely, uh, extinguish the, the mistakes that can be made. 
uh, but at least I can minimize them and get to a point where I can make a decision about whether to include an entry or not, uh, depending on the data that's available. Right. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like a monumental challenge. I can't, I can't even imagine. So, but it sounds like maybe you enjoy a good puzzle. And so this yeah. is definitely part of, uh, of the work. Yeah. It's uh, uh, my wife likes to tell me that I geek out when I, when I see <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I'm I doing like the, she's like, Oh, are you, you're working on that again. You're geeking out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Bedros asks, uh, this was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. My question is whether there, you have a plans to digitize Ottoman Greek print culture. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe both from Asia Minor, but also any uh, print media that was then created here um, in the United States after they immigrated. Do you have any plans to digitize those sorts of things? Wow, that, you know, um, very early on, I, I had the honor of meeting with uh, an individual in, in Massachusetts who, who you know, had a, um, a newspaper that was uh, printed uh, by her uh, grandfather in Izmir. Um, and as far as we both knew, it was the only version of that newspaper. Um, absolutely is the answer to that. You know, we're trying to uh, digitize all kinds of, as you saw, uh, all kinds of print media as well. Um, you know, the, the, whatever's been made available to us, uh, through the interviews will ultimately end up on, on, um, the digital collection at the University right. of Florida. Um, we have a question here and I think you touched on it a little bit, but, and this is sort of, I think this is one of the most probably common and complicated questions that you get, which is, can you talk a bit about the name, the term Ottoman Greeks rather than Asia minor Greeks or some other term? and sort of the layers of the national racial ethnic identity puzzle that, that, you know, that this is, you talked a little bit sort of the social aspects of this. I'm wondering if you can help for those who are maybe still a little curious or confused, suss that out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a question I get all the time, you know, about the name of the project. Um, and there's a, there's a very long story behind uh, the, uh, the origin of the name of the project. Uh, but the, the term itself, Ottoman Greeks and, and its origins, you know, and where that comes from, uh, that is a that is a, uh, a subject in and of itself. Um, and it's something that I'm going to flesh out in my dissertation uh, for sure. Uh, it's actually one of the major chapters that I'm going to write uh, about the origins of the term and other terms that are used to describe these immigrants and refugees uh, as they arrived to um, the United States. Um, and you know, there's with every, with any identity, as with any identity, there's there's this social construction process, uh, and that process comes from both uh, um, uh, what is you know the the uh, bottom up perspective, so the individuals themselves and how they identify themselves to to themselves and to their social circles, um, and we can't we can't really know that much about you know what how they identify to themselves. There's a whole literature you know, in psychology and sociology that talks about the social self, that talks about, you know, how individuals identify, you know, in and of themselves and that how private, you know, and personal that is. And then there's, there's this social self. It's what we present to the public, you know, um, and that can vary depending on who we're talking about. And in the interviews, this actually comes up over and over again, this difference between the way that uh, Ottoman Greeks identified to Greeks from Greece uh, versus, you know, their compatriots uh, versus uh, different ethnicities that were living in the United States at the time. Uh, you know, so, so that aspect was there, it was present, this bottom-up perspective and the differences, you know, the ways that they, they chose, uh, you know, what, how to personify themselves to these different uh, uh, groups. And then you have the top-down perspective. And this is, this is really where this term Ottoman Greek uh, uh, you know, really survives uh, to this day, uh, but survived was was definitely in use in the early 20th century. And that, that's from the US government and from English speaking countries. Uh, you know, it's well documented, of course, also in liter in scholarship that's out there uh, already, um, academic scholarship that's already out is, is already out there. But, you know, in primary source documents, you see it, you see it in the Ellis Island archive. Uh, you also see it uh, in, uh, you know, the, the British Foreign Office documents, um, you know, it's, it's this method by which the English speaking world uh, uh, 
uh, imagined and at the same time constructed the identity of immigrants coming from the former Ottoman Empire to the United States. You know, so they, they spoke of Ottomans and Turks um, and my dissertation is going to talk about, you know, how and why the choices were made to document one versus the other. Um, and uh, ultimately the outcomes that we see on the Ellis Island uh, archive manifest uh, are going to be, uh, you know, one of the central uh, uh, subjects of my dissertation. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah, that's great. Um, so I don't, maybe you said this already, but when, when can we expect your dissertation? What's your anticipated timeline for all of, I know the academic <laughs> when are you world be is done? Complex, <laughs> but, it's a yeah. question my, my, my spouse Eva has as well. <laughs> uh, so uh, at the moment, I, uh, I just completed uh, transcribing uh, interviews um, from uh, a recent round of interviews in May that I, that I uh, conducted. Uh, with the help and volunteering of, of descendants of immigrants from the former Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, I am now beginning the analysis of those interviews. The Ellis Island Archive uh, data collection is going to continue on, until I'm pretty much done with the analysis of the interviews. And, and my, my uh, 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 professor, the chair of my committee, uh, warned me. He said, when you're done with the interviews, you're going to stop collecting data from the Ellis Island archive, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I'm going to stop. I, I promise. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's where I am right now. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm still collecting data from the Ellis Island archive, and I'm also uh, analyzing data from the interviews. Uh, I'm a ho I hope that I will be done with the analysis and collection process by May at the latest, and that's when I'm going to begin writing. Uh, so probably sometime in May of 2022. Okay. Yeah. Well, we look forward to it, and, and you know maybe we'll have to have you come out and and present on your dissertation once it's published. So I would love to. I would love to, Brandon. Okay. Well, George, thank you so much for your time and your energy. It's been lovely to hear about this fascinating project, and it's and, you know we've seen in the comments and in the questions, and I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to all of the questions tonight. Um, but people who, for, for whom this is, this is important and personally important to them. And you, you talked a bit about identity and that how we see ourselves. And I think that this, this project uh, existing and being done sounds like it's providing uh, such a sense of, of affirmation to some, to some folks. So thank you so much for sharing with us and with everyone. Um, and of course, some folks have asked about, you know, can the, you know, is this going to be up after this? And I am happy to say, absolutely. Um, we're going to, We'll upload this in the next couple of days uh, to our uh, HACCM YouTube page, uh, and we'll send out an email to everyone um, who attended tonight, as well as uh, those who signed up, maybe couldn't make it, uh, so that you have links to that video, as well as li the links that George has provided here in the chat. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and plug in our own little uh, link here for supporting HACCM. Um, you know, there's enough to go around for everybody. So, you know, support the OGUS project, support HACCM. Um, and together we can continue to do uh, work like this, present projects like this, and, you know, George can continue with his team, the research that's happening, um, and we can, we can see that dissertation and, and see this website, uh, this resource grow. So, George, thanks again, um, and we just appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you all for taking the time out of your, out of your, out of your evenings to, uh, to hear me talk about Ottoman Greeks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much. Have a lovely evening, George. Everybody who's watching, you have a lovely evening as well, and a Merry Christmas and a, and a Happy New Year, however you celebrate. So uh, thanks so much, and have a great night. Take care. Have a good night.